note taking for everybody. Okay, so there are there are if you could click the link in the chat, you'll see it. So there are three um, three columns. One is um, the central one is for key images and ideas. So you're hearing stuff that you like, um, obviously, um, from anybody in this breakout room, uh, not just me and Shira, Molly. Um, and, and these don't have to be like profound takeaways, just anything that you hear that you like, uh, little snippets, um, drop them in there. Uh, on, on the left side is spontaneous commentary, and on the right side is questions. As kind of like a group note-taking, group poem, piece just uh put put anything anything you like in those in in those boxes as you go along uh that way we'll have some notes to share and everybody um will have something um oh yeah thank you um thank you for sharing that that screen share so that's uh that's for you guys and and we'll we'll reference this back um and also we want to start uh with a with a prompt sure you want to say something about the prompt yeah absolutely oh. Absolutely. I'm not muted. Okay, great. So yeah, we just wanted to open our prompt as we sanctify our thoughts, our space, our Google Docs don't always have their natural sanctification to them. So it takes a little bit of work. And part of it was sort of thread that ran through both my pedagogy and Jake's pedagogy is finding the sacred in unexpected ways, accessing it really in unexpected ways and finding it in unexpected places. Um, and so we hoped to just open with that question for you. Perhaps we have a smaller, more intimate group, which will feel more sacred if we can you know, think about that question. So often we, we think about constructs as formalized ones and we'll both share some of that right canonization is a key that comes up formulation as ways of sanctifying but so often it's an unexpected movement an unexpected interaction an unexpected activity or a text where we find the sacred so we just wanted to open with a question for everyone who has come today where have you found sacred um, in unexpected ways and places and for some it might be gardening for some it might be interactions with with a pet with a dog um, while on a hike these are ways that the sacred finds us as opposed to us finding the sacred. So I would love to hear a few voices before we start our conversation. And if anyone would like to share, you can just unmute yourselves or raise your hand. We would love to hear your voices. Or you can type into a chat if you're if you're comfortable. And um, you know, we were specifically thinking things that aren't like marked, uh, like as, as sacred, like prayer, we know, um, or, or you know, just uh, um, like blessings or something, but um, like like Shira is saying, maybe maybe gardening uh, or or hiking across the ocean uh, by 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 the ocean like feels feels really profound. Or you know, um, for me, when when my kids share uh, vulnerably their their emotions, that that just that kind of a conversation um, feels feels sacred. I love it. I'm going to start reading just a few and then we'll jump into our conversation as well. Some people wrote in the chat airports. I think that's a really incredible space where we wouldn't necessarily find the secret, but the idea of just mm -hmm. interacting. I'm kayaking in Maine, Elise. Thank you for that. Dancing at home with my daughter, Yona. Um, Susan wrote water, mm -hmm. engaging in water. Um, Sid re-encountering a person I knew in another context sometimes many years ago, that reintegration of a face from our lives. Jeremy, running water in nature, streams, waterfalls, and creeks. Valerie, finding myself in a room with my partner while he practices classical guitar, that sense that it's there. Um, just scrolling down, I love these two deep breaths on Shabbat during the blessings. Thank you, Robin. Stacy, the hour that my kids get home from school. Today's the first day for many of us. Jar, a bowling alley in Tennessee. Simon, listening to my children make sense of interpret their experiences. Susan, the classroom. Thank you so much, everyone, for getting us started with the way there are so many profound, unexpected places and spaces and ways that we access the sacred. Um, and so I'll stop the share now so I can see your faces and you can see us. You know, 
our entirety, sort of. Um, and so Jake and I are going to engage in, in a bit of conversation about our pedagogies. And we'll start, but each of us have prepared just a, a minute or two about ways of access into our pedagogy, how we came to it, why we came to it, and then we'll start more of a dialogue and talk a bit about our resources and then open up for Q&A so that we can all sanctify this um, community together. So my, my pedagogy, um, it was a, a pedagogy of sacred space that you heard from the opening. And uh, you know, I think when I think about this opportunity and Jake and, and I see, you know, we have other fellows who are here with us today. So it could be nice for all of us to engage with this question. What this fellowship really allowed for me to do, this is sort of the entry point to my pedagogy, was to take a step back um, at a moment, at a frenetic moment in life, at a COVID moment when everything felt like it was not sanctified, where there was chaos everywhere, and really look at um, a trajectory of experimentation over the past, for me, you know, 15 years of being an educator in different environments. I've taught in a lot of different environments, formal, informal, inside, outside, around picnic tables, on the grass, in a formal bait me drop in a legal conference room. I had a Talmud cheer when I was practicing law. I'm on the go, in my home, in a museum, immersive environments, salons in my yard, around the fire with my children. And I think really what I was seeking and craving was the opportunity to say, you've been thrown into all these different contexts and different spaces and different environments, many of them sacred um, by their nature and many of them not classically sacred spaces, but to be able to say, what's the blueprint here, right? Take a step back and extract the principles, the overarching frameworks from the practice that I was already engaged in and really have the opportunity to formalize and bridge both the theory and the practice. Um, and, and kind of this relates to questions of the worldview and anchoring this project in a Torah worldview. Now, I've written a lot about this in the concept paper. I invite everyone to read that. Um, but, but just to give a very a taste, right? when we look at the Torah as a blueprint for design, it really offers us a way to think about sanctification because we don't just walk into spaces and have them transform us. Um, we transform them and then they transform us. And so I think in many ways we need to be deliberate about design. And I speak at length about deliberate design, the Torah as a model for deliberate design, both in creation and in the construction of the tabernacle, different modalities of design with express purpose and, and as we opened with concepts of restriction. Those are three prongs. I won't go any further now, but those are three prongs that sort of animate me all the research that I did in, in stepping back and really trying to create a framework and practice, which we'll talk more about, um, that express purpose, deliberate design, and how restriction comes into play in thinking about space anchored in our, in our, in our sacred spaces informed from our, our Jewish worldview and our texts. So I'm going to shift it over to Jake to talk a bit about his worldview, and then we'll start a Q&A a bit more um, in a few minutes. Thank you, Shira. That was awesome. Uh, I see a question in the chat. Can you state three prongs? Um, just um, good. Um, we can put them in the chat and also um, in, in the three prongs of the of the document that we shared with you folks. Uh, thank you, uh, people dropping uh, some notes in there already. Um, let's let's use it. Um, okay, so um, um, once again, I'm, I'm I'm Jake Marmer. I'm and and um, I'm gonna uh, do a, a, a quick. Um, snippet of, of, of my pedagogy and then um, kind of direct a question towards Shira and, and we'll lob a few questions back and forth and then also just invite you to join uh, questions at any at, uh, with questions at any point. Um, so um, I'm, a, I'm a poet and performer and, and I'm also education director for Bronfman Fellowship. And so my pedagogy is um, at that uh, very specific intersection um, of Jewish learning and, 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 and poetry. So I'm, I'm calling my pedagogy contemporary poetry as a sacred text. And what I'm proposing is that, is, is that there is a mode of discovering, <laughs> studying, 
teaching and composing contemporary poetry as, as a kind of a sacred Jewish ritual or sacred Jewish text. I think there is a need for, um, for new, uh, inclusive contemporary Jewish texts to be held sacred and to help us kind of discern the mythic outline of, of what it means to be Jewish today. That's what uh, poetry and literature and the arts more broadly have been used for, uh, for such a long time. Um, just a, a quick uh, quick pause. Um, to see some people are not muted. Um, so if, if you could please just uh, double check that you're muted because I'm, I'm, I'm overhearing stuff. Thank you. Um, so I, what, what I'm um, working through in my paper is that Jewish ed educators can go through a process of careful selection uh, and deep entang entanglements uh, with contemporary poetry and, and learn to hold them as sacred texts and learn to teach them uh, as sacred texts and create environments in which um, uh, these texts can be uh, held as sacred, um, can be uh, understood as such and engaged with uh, in that particular way. My understanding of Jewish spiritual um, experience is that it is oftentimes synonymous um, with a spiritual encounter with the text. Um, and while I had profound experiences with various sacred Jewish texts from, you know, the canon uh, that Shira referenced, I also had profound experiences with uh, Jewish texts that are not considered to be the sacred canon, uh, whether it's poetry or, or, or prose literary works. Some of uh, these works may uh, exhibit uh, a ambivalent relationship to Judaism, may, may have doubt or skepticism, may even somehow uh, disguise uh, their Jewishness. And, and it's clear to me that it's those characteristics that drew me uh, to these texts uh, to begin with. And um, they um, have a certain kind of existential quest that I personally have held sacred. Uh, and they also allow for subversion, for self-reinvention, for humor, uh, these things that uh, I think are uh, crucially important to one's kind of a sacred textual experience. So this started as um, an idea and an attempt to distill some thinking into an essay form and it kind of grew into what, what I feel like is now a, a curriculum for, for a course. Um, I'm going to um, pilot uh, a, a version of it for the ritual well, um, just a, a little bit later this fall. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about it, but this, this is just a, a, a tiny preview. So, um, uh, of what I've been working on. Um, so Shira and I will exchange a few questions um, and folks, please do uh, add things into the chat and, and, and the notes and, and we'll leave even more uh, space at the end um, for, uh, f for further questions. So I want to, I want to just having read Shira's paper, I, there was a, there was a, um, a, a specific bit that really stood out to me. She wrote um, and in her recommendation of, what practices uh, one needs to do to create a sacred uh, space, physical space. Um, Shira writes, ask family members to make a list of areas where they have spontaneously felt a special connection with themselves and or with others. So ask family members to make a list of areas where um, they have spontaneously felt a special connection with themselves and others. And so what that indicates to me is that big part of creating a sacred experience is locating where it found us already in the past. Um, it seems to have happened kind of unexpectedly. And that's part of the design that um, you can kind of plan on it. So my question uh, to Shira and, and her work is to what extent can one prepare and anticipate and even teach, um, you know, that which happens organically and unexpectedly and that's that's the whole um that seems to be the whole point so often thank you jake um it's such a great question and i really love it and i think it also it hits upon a lot of the anxieties or many of the anxieties i have about this work this line of work this particular practice and then and the angles so i'll sort of get the anxieties out of the way now um, as an answer to that question and um, you know as i talk about in my paper the practice that i propose for concretizing sacred space is an explicit practice 
right? It, it works through in order for something to be a practical module to kind of pull off the shelf in many ways. We want to provide, and the design of this program is to provide those explicit practices. And yet that comes with positives and negatives, right? There is a sense of sacred finds us in organic and holistic ways and looking for it will sometimes obviate right, the need for it in the first place when we go out and look for it. And in many ways, the tension in concretizing sacred space, finding sacred space or sanctifying space that has found us is that sort of inhabiting of both those worlds, implicit, explicit, organic, natural versus forced. And that's something, you know, we can, it can feel quite forced when we have family members sort of walk around and say, well, recall, where did you feel something that you would define as sacred? And now mark it and think about it. And let's think about how we want to keep that space and preserve the sanctity of space. And so while that tension is there, uh, I will say that actually in many ways, much of Jewish worldview inhabits that idea that we stop and we concretize things, right? We're conscious and we're deliberate about activities, spaces, objects, tools, modalities, times that have found us. And so much a part of the, the sort of Judaic worldview, and I'll give an example in just a second from, from a Shna in Kelim that has seemingly to do with a very different space, but it, it is about finding a specific function for something that actually the function has already found us. And as soon as we elevate it and we sanctify it and we name and we mark the function, it is then sanctified. Um, and the examples abound in, um, in laws of purity and impurity, which is not necessarily a natural place that we would jump to in our daily lives when we think about what are practical takeaways of finding sacred space. And yet, and again, you can read about this in, in, my, in the concept paper. I quote a Mishnah from Kalim, a rabbinic text, an early rabbinic text that talks about a vessel becoming subject right, to purity and impurity once it is actually marked with like a conscious and deliberate sense of this vessel is utilized for a particular purpose. And so even though if it's always been used all along for that purpose, it's elevated to a different level when we deliberately stop and sanctify it. And I think that it's a conceptual notion. It's a conceptual framework that can actually really be deliberately teased out in our daily lives. Um, you know, to think about the reality of, well, sacred has found us, it's organic. And yet the moment we stop, even if it feels artificial, to stop and deliberately be conscious of it, it does elevate it to another level. Now that's a legal text and it's a very technical legal text. Now again, my background is in law, so I'm always looking at law as ways to say, in what way can the law actually inform notions of, um, of the practical and pedagogical. But things happen to us in different spaces. And when we get, when we stop and we have the moment to stop to recognize the organic nature, then we kind of elevate it and sanctify it to an even higher level. And we think about that in terms of Shabbat and time as well, right? We're, we're not talking about sanctification of time, but many of these frameworks can be utilized in different notions and um, notions of the secrets. So I hope that offers a bit of an answer, Jake, in the more, in the, in the world of fear, um, to, to your question. And I think I want to pose a question back to you. It's a, again, a bit of a, a question that um, I hope will we'll provide from a challenging standpoint, um, a larger contextualization. Much of your pedagogy and the core of your pedagogy is about expanding the Jewish canon, right? An expansion of the Jewish canon, what we mean by sacred texts, um, utilizing contemporary poetry in particular and poetic texts as this kind of form of contemporary prophecy and, and a discourse of vision that can be utilized in a way that feels very, very personal. And it can be the building block building blocks for an expanded way of thinking, and this is in your language, much of this paraphrase in your language, so I invite everyone to read that, and an expanded way of thinking about notions, both of the sacred and notions of canon, right? What's in and what's out. And you make an incredible case for it, and such a compelling case. I loved reading all about it, and, and it sparked all kinds of visions of what can be included in that new canon of prophecy. 
But I wonder, oh, and I wonder really, if you might offer um, as a framing counterpoint some of the negatives of expanding the canon and perhaps drawbacks that might be involved in such an expansion of the canon of that which is sacred um, as, a, as a framing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shira. Okay, so I'm going to say a few words um, to, to Shira's question. Um, about the positives and the negatives of expanding the canon and and obviously i invite other folks to to chime in and we'll have uh just a, a few minutes after my answer to uh, answer some more questions so please um uh, keep keep those questions uh handy um so i i think you know we can we can agree on the positives of of, of canon expansion just uh, more more text to live by more text to embody more text to find ourselves inside of and and, and use to um, make sense of of the world um more ways to 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 include um you know people uh in our in our community and in, in kind of like what is what is the sacred discourse what is the issue with the canon uh with expanding the canon I mean, you know, it's like um, there's that Groucho Marx joke. Like, I, I wouldn't want to be a member of a club that would have somebody like me as a member. I, I, I think, um, you know, the, the the minute getting somebody gets included in the canon, uh, what do they want to be in the canon? I I have a sense that a lot of you know writers and poets that I engage in and whose work I hold sacred may balk at at being called uh, sacred. Jewish canon, they may want to be part of sacred universal canon. Being part of the canon is really, really uncool. Um, you know, especially for artists or creative people, people who create the sorts of things that much later become canon. At the time of their creation, they break the ground in some way. They shake up um, the scene and, and, and the situation. And, and um, for them to be uh, suddenly you know, canon, which is often associated with, with the establishment, is uh, uh, is 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 counter uh, is counterproductive. So, um, you know, these these are some of the um, some of the things that come to mind. Uh, obviously, also Shira, you know, in the in the beginning, you used that word instrumentalized. Uh, it's a very important word. You know, something sacred is specifically something that can be uh, instrumentalized. But the minute you know a text becomes canonical it's up for grabs for political uh, purposes um, other other kinds of purposes it becomes uh, indeed uh, in instrumentalized and that's 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 the danger uh, of it i think okay i'm gonna just uh, uh st stop here i i, I think and an, an open uh, for questions from from you folks you can um unmute yourself um and ask or put them in the in the chat or or um yeah, and, and anything, anything you like. Yeah, I, I want to make one comment on your last statement, Jake. It brought to mind the notion of the kinds of uh, pieces of literature or poetry that you might bring into what we would call a sacred canon would violate the original intent of the author or the creator of that. Uh, it's very reminiscent of a classic piece written by Max Weber uh, a long time ago about sect and church. Uh, he makes a point about in the history of religions, sects are breakaways from established churches who feel that those institutions have become ossified and no longer relatable to most people. So a sect, S-E-C-T, is a breakaway movement usually filled with much fervor and enthusiasm and passion, uh, but sects invariably evolve into their own church institutions. Uh, and so that's a constant phenomenon in the history of you know, human wisdom about how we break away from establishment sources to be on the cutting edge and the cutting edge, if it's compelling enough, will itself become institutionalized in a way and go flat and lose a lot of its its uh, uh, the passion that gave it gave it birth. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that comment. I mean, agreed. And I, I think we'll agree. Um, um, this, 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 is, this is absolutely relevant to, to the notion of the sacred when you're creating something new that suddenly feels sacred. But, or, or, you know, coming back to it over, over and over uh, is kind of wears it down. Yeah, Shira, well, creating a space, how does it remain sacred? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I, there's so much rich conversation that can come out of this. I see that we are, we're closing out this breakout room in just a minute. And I, I don't want us to leave, or I do want us to leave with something to take. Right. And that is, you'll see when you go to the, the website and all the materials afterwards that for each of these conversations, which we're inhabiting the land of the theory a bit more in this conversation, there's the practical, there's the pedagogical, and each one of us has created a resource, a module, um, you Jake's is a collection of pro poems to utilize with different prompts in particular environments. Mine is more of a card game based on images of my photography um, to tease out some of the theory um, into a practical question of when we're inhabiting new space, how can we tease out the notions of what is sacred and the 